Pizza Tower is finally here. I first heard about the game sometime after I reviewed the Wario Land games several years ago and was instantly drawn in by its fast-paced Wario Land 4-inspired gameplay and unique manic art style, and I've been following the game's development ever since. I decided to avoid playing any of the demos though, that way I could go into the full release completely fresh. After years of waiting, on December 2nd, 2022, the game suddenly appeared on Steam with an imminent release date of January 26th, 2023, and the hype train was in full gear. For the next month and a half, all I could think about was playing Pizza Tower and how excited I was for the game. I just knew I had to make a video about it as soon as I could, so I recorded my entire first playthrough and paid extra close attention to every little detail I could. I'm happy to report that Pizza Tower stands tall next to its inspirations, while providing a distinct charm of its own to set it apart. So let's dive deeper into what makes Pizza Tower so good. Quick heads up before we start though, there will be spoilers ahead. This game is still hot out of the oven, so be careful. I'll save the major spoilers for a dedicated spoiler section later on, but I know some of you might want a fresh slice, so you've been warned. Finally, if you enjoy this video, it would really help out my channel's growth a lot if you leave a like and a comment, and subscribe if you're new. Algorithm and all that. Alright, on with the review. Pizza Tower opens with your average middle-aged Italian man, Peppino Spaghetti, struggling to make ends meet in his independent pizza restaurant, when suddenly a giant floating pizza with a face on it shows up to threaten Peppino with a laser that'll destroy his restaurant. Peppino runs off to the competing Pizza Tower next door to destroy it and keep his business safe. Throughout the ascent, you'll have to knock out these support pillars in every level, and then escape back to the start of the level before Pizza Face takes notice and catches up to you. Each floor ends in a boss fight with one of Pizza Face's mercenaries, including an artist Pepper, a gunslinging cheese blob, and The Noise, a hyper rabbit-like creature. I won't spoil all of the bosses here, I'll at least wait until later in the video for a spoiler section, but they get pretty crazy later on. You'll also meet a few friends throughout the tower, such as Gustavo and his pet rat Brick, who are a playable duo in a couple of stages, Jerome, one of the Pizza Tower staff who operates lifts and unlocks secret doors for you, Mr. Stick, who acts as the money bags of this game, and John the pillars that hold up each level. Their name is John. While the game has a kooky cast of characters, there isn't actually any dialogue whatsoever, barring a few tutorials that these pizza ladies give you. Well, there is one that isn't a tutorial, but she's not very nice. Point is, the storytelling is pretty minimal. I could nitpick it, like how it makes no sense for Pizza Face to warn Peppino that he's gonna blow up his restaurant. He could've just done it, and since there's no dialogue, I can't really analyze why he would do this beyond mere speculation, but it doesn't really matter that much. The story isn't the focus of Pizza Tower, it's more about the vibe. It's hard to care about there not being much of a narrative here when it's constantly drawing me in with its expressive insanity. Everything in Pizza Tower is drawn to fit within a manic energy that persists throughout the entire game. Peppino himself is incredibly well animated. Each and every frame looks properly cartoonish and crazy. Enemy designs are unique and inventive, and their eyes will pop out of their heads when you run towards them at max speed. Characters overreact to every little thing, and exaggeration is put to great use in all of the sprites. There is so much charm in this game's sprite work, I couldn't possibly list every single example, but I will share some highlights at least. For one, every level has its own title card, often with unique art styles and silly poses. Some of these are absolute gems too, like Peppybot Factory, Golf, and my favorite, Gnome Forest. One of the later levels, Don't Make a Sound, has a gimmick where you're being chased by giant mutated topping monsters, and when they catch you it plays a jump scare, but there's a small chance that when you get caught it'll instead show Peppino and the topping monsters celebrating Oktoberfest, which made me laugh my ass off when this first happened instead of a jump scare. The game is absolutely chock full of hilarious sprites and easter eggs, like a few secret rooms hidden throughout the tower hub, or even the game's desktop icon. If you find it too intrusive, you can disable the HUD elements and the options, but it's just too funny for me to turn it off. You get this up-close Peppino cam in the top right corner of the screen at all times, changing to match his state, whether you're running, getting hit, or in one of the game's many transformation states. They all have unique animations, and it always gives me a laugh to look up there and see what's going on. The sprite work all looks like it was drawn in MS Paint or something, which is not a complaint. I absolutely love the way it looks. It's basically like a slightly higher res pixel art, which is a style I've seen a few games using recently. Environments all look really nice, with each level having a unique visual theme as well. The first level does look a bit blocky, but it wasn't an issue I noticed with any other level. The rest all looked great. I'm really impressed with the variety here too. Considering the game has like 20 levels and not a single one of them looks generic or repetitive, that's pretty impressive. 
You have some really cool ideas for platformer levels here, like a golf course, a city of pig people, a war-torn battlefield, and a graveyard. Even when the level tropes are a little overdone, they do something new and unique with them, like the Wild West Desert level that has pizza-themed supermarkets loaded throughout it, and then ends in you running into a UFO filled with alien enemies and cows that kick you around. Or the ice level that later gives you a spicy pepper pizza slice that turns Peppino into a fiery demon, destroying everything in his path. There is so much ingenuity on display with these level themes. It makes sense given the Wario Land 4 inspiration, but even that game had a couple slightly less interesting themes. Not so in Pizza Tower. Every level stands out with memorable themes and unique aspects. Even the level's names are funny, like Blood Sauce Dungeon, Refrigerator, Refrigerador, Freezerator, and Oh Shit. There's a level in this game called Oh Shit. They just went all out with this game. No filter, just pure chaos from start to finish. I love it. Even the in-game text's font is unique, and I love the way it looks with these thick drop shadows. On the more technical side, all of the art was drawn in a 960 by 540 canvas, meaning the game will cleanly scale to 1080p and 4K. But if you have a 2K monitor or something, the scaling won't be perfect if you play it in full screen. It's not a huge deal, but with pixel art, I know that stuff matters to a lot of people, myself included, so it's worth mentioning. The game has a number of resolution options, but you're going to want to play it in an integer of 540 for the best experience. Changing the resolution doesn't seem to do anything when you're in full screen though, so it probably just ignores this and sets it to whatever your monitor resolution is. Fine by me, since my monitor is 4K and that's a clean integer scale. There's also an option for texture filtering, but turning it on and off didn't seem to do anything, so I'm not entirely sure what it does, but it was on for my entire recorded playthrough. As far as performance goes, I didn't run into any issues. It ran at a silky smooth 60fps the entire time, and the game never crashed on me once. I only encountered one bug in my entire playthrough where one of the achievements wouldn't work if you entered a secret room during your run of the level, and I had to go ask people in the Pizza Tower Discord for help, where they told me that the secret room bugs out the tracker for the achievement. This bug then got patched later that very same day, no joke. Actually, there was a second bug I encountered in my second playthrough where the pop-up for the Sage Blue clothes procced twice for some reason. Once after being the fourth level on the first floor, like it should, and then again after the first level of the second floor. Maybe it has something to do with the fact that I exited to the menu during the cutscene to skip it and save some time? I don't know. That said, the game is actively being updated and slightly rebalanced constantly. For example, I actually felt that the requirement for beating the game was pretty high, only allowing you to miss 5 of the 95 toppings to access the final boss. But the same day I finished the game, they later released a patch lowering the requirement so you can miss up to 9 toppings now. It's not a huge deal for me since I was 100%ing the game anyway, but that's still a change that I appreciate. Even that weird double clothing unlock glitch got patched as I was writing this script. The devs are clearly taking community feedback into account and updating the game accordingly, so it's very possible that any complaints I bring up will be addressed by the time you're watching this. In fact, I had a whole ramble about how annoying it was that the game doesn't hide your cursor when in full screen, but they patched that out too. Though not until after I recorded an entire playthrough, so sorry for any lingering mouse cursors on the footage. The sound design and music both perfectly complement the manic energy of the visuals as well. The soundtrack was composed by three people, with Ronan de Castel, aka Mr. Sauceman, behind most of the level themes, and Klasky Jiddo, aka Frostix, in charge of the other level themes, the remixes for the secret rooms, and some miscellaneous menu themes, with Post Elvis responsible for the file select theme. The soundtrack is incredible all around, everyone on the team did a fantastic job bringing a unique vibe that fits the game's aesthetic perfectly. There's a decent amount of genre variety, but it's mostly underscored by a funk style with accentuated bass riffs, guitar solos, fun percussion tracks, record scratches, and lots of sound effects on samples, some that you might even recognize. There's a great amount of instrument variety on display too, like automatones, chiptune waves, synthesized vocals, orchestra hits, and even a remix of a 1920s song for the final boss that goes way too hard.
Some levels have two themes for different sections of the level too, which is extra effort that I really appreciate. As if that wasn't enough, each level theme has a chill remix that plays in the secret room, and they're all wonderful. They have this consistent instrumentation and style that makes them stand out in a cohesive way that I really love. The game was originally going to have a unique remix of every level theme for the escape sequence too, but the original It's Pizza Time was so good that they decided to just keep that for every level in the game, and honestly I have no complaints, this is one of my favorite songs in the game. They even remixed the iconic pizza song for the tutorial level. Beautiful. This entire soundtrack is just full of bangers from start to finish. I absolutely love it. The in-game sound effects are also great. Every one of Pepino's moves has a perfect amount of crunch to it. Collectibles all feel satisfying to pick up, and blasting through enemies feels so good. Not to mention the amount of random voice lines that really accentuate each action, like when Pepino gets hurt, or the whistle when you get a good combo, or the taunt sound effect. And like, why does Jerome make this sound when you pick him up? Of course, we can't forget Pepino's iconic scream. Everything about the game's sound design perfectly ties into that chaotic nature, while also providing some incredible tunes that I'll be listening to for a long time. Everyone seems to love Pizza Tower's unique aesthetics, though, not just me. In fact, I've even brought my good friend Hot Cider on to share his own perspective on why Pizza Tower's unique stylings work so well. Take it away. From its first screenshots, Pizza Tower made an immediate impression on the strength of its visual style, and with its final release, the title continues to astound. Tour de Pizza created a world of sentient czar, strange entities, and perhaps the most stressed out protagonist in video games, all of which have been painstakingly hand-drawn and animated frame by frame. A common point of praise from reviews is that Pizza Tower looks like a playable cartoon, this is true, but to Pizza Tower's credit, the look is more than skin deep. Not only does the game ape aesthetic qualities, but cartoon logic is baked very much into the experience. Video games as a medium incorporates multiple art forms, user experience design, foleying, and of course art and animation. Whether a character is made out of pixels or polygons, a creative force was responsible for how they look and move. Entire genres hinge on animation. Platformers, for example, convey their mechanics by how a character navigates a physical space. And of course, realism, or lack thereof, comes courtesy of how lifelike a performance is. But for the purpose of celebrating Peter Tower's look, let's speak exclusively about game animation that has strived to imitate cartoons. Peter Tower takes its inspiration from the look and tone of 1990s New Wave American cartoons, and how that inspired the 2000s era webtoon boom. The Age of Oaks is one that could be described as postmodern, not in the classical arts sense, but in the fact that its greatest proponents were consciously moving away from the look that had defined the Disney era. Back then, rotoscoping was employed to give animation a more realistic look, and attention was put on elaborately painted backgrounds. These cartoons instead took inspiration from elsewhere, such as the earlier era of rubber hose animation that defied logic for visual gags, defined by the work of Max Fleischer's Felix the Cat, and even the early work of Walt Disney. They also took liberally from Tex Avery's work on the Merry Melody series for Warner Brothers, and his later work on Tom and Jerry. There were even allusions to the groundbreaking work done by UPA, where abstraction was employed in character and background designs. The 90s era brought all these concepts back, but with an edge defined by the grunge rock era. Ren and Stimpy is maybe the clearest example of this. Its titular characters evoke the early era of cat vs dog cartoons, but how their bodies squash, stretch and transform, either through taking physical harm or just sheer emotion, is unlike anything done in the pre-war era. The show was notable for his gross-out close-ups, 
where the art style would suddenly shift to include additional detail. On the flip side, background art was often simplified into basic outlines and shapes to give the illusion of space, but the focus was always entirely on the titular characters. Ren and Stimpy's plots were often evocative of old cartoons also, where the characters would have to get jobs or end up in an odd scheme. What was less nostalgic was the extreme mood swings, often the result of tasks going horribly wrong. Some episodes would end with the characters at a point of no return, but the joke was that come the next episode things would be reset back to normal. No permanent scars from their experiences, at least on the outside. As for webtoons, many who grew up on cartoons like this made the transition in the early 2000s to websites like Newgrounds, a hub for emerging animators to demonstrate their abilities. Although the website allowed for all comers, many brought their creations to life with crack copies of Macromedia Flash, a program designed for presentations that nevertheless had an incredibly robust frame by frame timeline. Although Flash was better remembered for its crappy tweening, it could also support hand drawn vector animation, which with enough time and talent could imitate the look of traditional work. Where Flash was at its most appealing was somewhere in the middle, where there was a talent behind the work, but flaws in the process added to the quality. Keyframes and poses were more extreme here because of the economy of less frames to work with. It was an evolution then on what these previous cartoons were doing, but pushed to further extremes due to limitation. This feeds very much into Pizza Tower and its extreme animation poses. Granted, although it feels flash in spirit, the levels, props and actors are all drawn in a thin, hard pixel line style that evokes Microsoft Paints, with a limited colour scheme to match. So aesthetically, Pizza Tower hits the mark, but what makes it feel like a playable cartoon is its approach to cartoon logic. Like Ren and Stimpy, Peppino cannot be permanently harmed or killed, either between levels or even within them. The joke is always on having these attacks result in a funny animation, and never at the cost of player frustration. In some instances, these attacks transform Peppino into new shapes, similar to how the characters in Tom and Jerry would shapeshift into visual gags based on how they were hurt. There are moments in Pizza Tower where Peppino takes on the shape of a baseball to best fit in the gloves of a pitcher, or is even squashed into a pizza box that flaps around. Although it is a callback to the Wario Land games, those same Wario games did take influence from these early cartoons to shape its shape-shifting protagonist. The fact that Peppino can't take harm isn't just a cool callback to the cartoons, but it shapes the entire experience. Pizza Tower is built for going fast and having a blast, and a Super Mario or Sonic-like health system would run counter to that. Instead, by embracing cartoon logic, Pizza Tower buffs out those rough edges and becomes something better. Cartoons found a lot of their early concepts from silent films, due to a similar technological limitation, where slapstick and calamity were off motivators for comedy. Here, Pizza Tower is explicitly built around things going from bad to worse, all at the player's hand. When, at the level's end point, they take out a pillar and have to race back to the entrance to avoid the wrath of the game's central villain. Compared to a game, say, based more directly on Ren and Stimpy, where characters just need to navigate from left to right like a bad Mario clone, this need to navigate forward then escape back as quickly as possible feels more within the spirit of the medium. Torta Pizza could have gone as far as recreating the look of these cartoons and their final product would still be considered excellent, but Pizza Tower is so built out of cartoon logic that it propels itself into something special, following in the early footsteps of Donkey Kong all the way to Cuphead. Pizza Tower is the latest example of how taking rules from cartoons opens new opportunities, transformations, a refusal for permanent harm, and a cast of strange antagonists and problems are all some of the elements that make Pizza Tower a playable cartoon. It's a title that I hope sets a precedent for others to follow, whether it's in imitating the look of other areas of animation or even other art styles. This has been Hot Cider, and you can hear more about my thoughts on Pizza Tower or other games over on my channel at Hot Cider. H O T C Y D E R. Aesthetically, Pizza Tower is in a league of its own. The sprite work, animation, music, and sound effects all come together to make this manic energy that really gives the game a unique personality, and they never drop it for even a second. It's one of the game's most defining features. But what really ties all of it together and makes Pizza Tower one of my favorite games in recent memory is its gameplay. Starting off with the controls, Pizza Tower is one of those games with a learning curve to it. At first, the movement might feel somewhat clunky and unintuitive, but many elements of the game's design push you to master its controls early on, and once you've done that, you can conquer these levels like it's nothing, and it feels incredible. 
Pepino has a few basic moves, a couple of more advanced techniques, and a whole bunch of ways to combo moves into each other. To start, Pepino can dash with the X button, Xbox controller layout by the way. Grabbing is useful for picking up enemies and throwing them, but can also get you up to a higher speed in a smaller area. You run by holding the right trigger, which allows you to run up walls that you can then jump off of. Running for long enough starts a full speed dash that can break through metal crates and enemies with ease. That sounds like it would be overpowered, but the levels are designed in such a way that while you can dash through the entire thing at max speed with enough skill, it's not always easy to do so, and you certainly won't be doing that on your first run of a level. When at full speed, you can hold up to charge a sort of shine spark that flings Pepino upwards. The Y button makes Pepino do a taunt move that looks really silly at first, but when you find out that it can parry any attack with the right timing, it becomes a vital part of your moveset. Pressing down in midair will do a ground pound, and this is a really great move. It can break metal crates from above if you have enough room to build up speed while you fall, but it can also combo right into a dash with no slowdown if you land on the slope. If you're running though, pressing down in the air will instead do a dive, which is great for conserving momentum in certain spots, but can be a little bit situational. Sometimes you want to ground pound, but end up diving instead. That's where the more advanced techniques come into play. Press A during a dive, and Pepino will instead ground pound without losing momentum. Turning around while at a full speed run will make Pepino skid the opposite direction, and that can be used to slide off of ledges and around tight corners without losing max speed. Remember the shine spark jump? You can grab to the left or right mid jump to cancel it and redirect your momentum sideways, directly into a full speed dash. One of my favorite moves is the uppercut, done by pressing up and X at the same time. It thrusts you into the air with a huge attacking hitbox that's really useful for killing enemies instantly, which can come in very handy for quickly resetting the combo meter. The best thing about these controls though is that all of these moves gracefully flow into each other. Holding the run button during a grab will transition you instantly into a run with an extra speed boost. Grabbing into a wall while running will make you instantly start wall running. After diving into the ground, Pepino will get right back up and keep running. Ground pounding into a slope gives you instant max running speed. You can combo every one of these moves together without slowing down at all, and once you've mastered it, it makes you feel like a speedrunner. It may take a bit of getting used to, but similar to games like Super Mario Sunshine, it rewards skilled players with a sense of speed matched only by games like Sonic, but with less clunkiness and rote memorization of massive level layouts. This game feels so good to play at a high level, and it'll keep me coming back to it for years. All of that is just for Pepino's default controls. There are a number of things that alter your controls, including an entirely different playable character, Gustavo and Brick. One of the bosses, The Noise, was also planned to be playable, but was delayed to launch the game on time. That said, he will show up in a later update eventually, so be on the lookout for that. Apparently there was also a co-op mode of some kind that was planned and even included in one of the demo builds, but it was removed from the final release. It might come back in a later update, but I wouldn't get my hopes up. Anyway, to incentivize your mastery of the game's controls, Pizza Tower is filled with side quests that really push you to your limits. Each level has three secrets to find, five cage top and rescue, one treasure that you need to find your roam to unlock, and a score-based rank. Each top in your rescue is worth $10, and the money is then used to open boss gates. Like I said earlier, you only need 86 of the 95 total top ins to unlock the final boss. Finding all the treasures will change your ending, and finding all the secrets unlocks a sound test. The top ins are pretty easy to find, as they're mostly along the beaten path, or at most off slightly to the side, or locked behind a sort of puzzle element. Jerome and the treasure door are usually not too hard to find so long as you're exploring thoroughly. The secrets can be a little too well hidden though, with a few of them being pretty poorly telegraphed or locked behind a point of no return. I needed to look a few of them up, but honestly I didn't really mind it that much. It was only a handful of secrets out of the entire game. In fact, most of them are pretty well hidden. Many will have little toppings placed in out of the way areas to guide you towards them, or have an eyeball marking on the wall to show you where they are, or just play off your curiosity in a clever way. One of my favorites is this one in Crust Cove. You come up to this area with a vertical line of enemies and a caged top end on the top left. You might notice, however, that the middle section up here has no roof, but there's seemingly nothing there. A curious player might take note of that and explore up in this section, and what do you know, that's a secret. Or this one in Oh Shit, where you have to keep the lid from this trash can all the way to this water current that would normally send you backwards when you touch it. This one's really clever. But still, some of them are just not well hidden. Like this one in Deep Dish 9, where you're supposed to just know to turn the rocket around into this totally inconspicuous wall. I never would have found this without looking it up. I guess you're supposed to notice this chunk of asteroid sticking out here, but when you're rushing through the escape sequence, it just kind of blends into the background. That said, one of the patch notes that came out towards the end of my playthrough mentioned some secrets were made more clear, but I'm not sure which ones they're talking about. My complaints there might just not be an issue for you if you're playing this game fresh after this patch, so take it with a grain of salt. Additionally, unlike the toppins, if you miss one of the secrets, you can't just go back to grab the one you missed. You have to get all three in one run. 
That's not really a big deal if you're going for 100% though, because of the way the ranking system works. The ranks are purely for extra percentage on your file, and don't unlock anything besides some clothes. The clothes are just different costumes unlocked by doing various random tasks. They're global unlocks too, so they'll apply to all files. I didn't bother getting all of them because, frankly, I don't feel like replaying the game several more times and grinding out all of the P ranks. S ranks were good enough for me so that I could clear all the achievement rooms and get 100%. I'll definitely go back for the rest of the clothes and the P ranks later, but for now I'm fine with just getting the S ranks, as they're already pretty damn hard. So long as you explore the level well and find most of the stuff, you'll probably end up with an A rank on your first run through a level, but if you manage to get everything and complete the second lap of the escape sequence, you can nab an S rank. P ranks are the ultimate challenge, requiring you to do everything you needed for the S rank, but without dropping your combo at all. I'll explain the combo meter in more depth a little later, but that's a lot harder than it sounds. I did manage to get a couple P ranks while just going for the S ranks in my first playthrough, and I've since gone back to get even more. Either way, this is the best way that the game incentivizes mastery. Not only are you required to be proficient in your exploration, since the point bonuses from the secrets, toppings, and treasures are all required to get it, but you also need to be skilled at navigating the levels quickly enough to make it through the escape sequence two times for the lap 2 bonus without running out of time and dying to Pizza Face. That's the only way you can die in this game, by the way. Getting hit just makes you lose some points and cuts down the remaining timer on your combo meter, but sometimes it can still be recovered if you're quick. The combo meter itself is pretty straightforward. Killing enemies will increase it by one, and idling around for too long will cause the combo to end, as shown by this flame on the combo meter. You can add time to it by doing pretty much any other interaction with the level design, like destroying objects, grabbing little toppings, finding the treasure, freeing cage toppings, and so on. Levels are designed perfectly around skilled players always being able to keep up their combo meter if they know what they're doing. You'll almost always find something to keep your meter up in side areas or in between enemies. Secret rooms always have lots of stuff to keep your meter going, and Jerome and the treasure both reset the combo meter's timer, so everything can always be done in one continuous combo as long as you're fast enough. Even in the escape sequence they thought of this. Enemies will get spit out into the stage during the escape so that you still have something to keep your combo going with even in rooms you've already emptied. Plus there are the clocks littered around that act identically to the little toppings but can only be picked up during the escape. Even when you go to lap 2, all the clocks and escape exclusive enemies respawn, letting you increase your combo even higher and get even more points. The combo system is at the center of every level in this game, and it makes going for S or even P ranks a blast. I mentioned the achievement rooms earlier. These are rooms that show all of the chef tasks for each floor, with three per level, one for S ranking all the levels in that floor, and one for beating the floor's boss damageless. These tasks can range from beating a level without taking a certain type of damage, to finding a hidden room, to something more trivial like taunting next to a bee. Some of these it feels like they kinda ran out of ideas, but it's a small minority. The first level has some of the hardest achievements in the game, requiring both a speedrun of the level in under 2 minutes, and a run that gets a perfect combo of 99. If you're like me and you want to 100% everything as you go, you might spend a good few hours grinding the first level of the game. In the moment, it was kind of frustrating and tedious, but looking back, I'm really glad I did it when I did. These are hard, and forcing myself to master the controls that early on helped me so much in getting comfortable with the game's flow, and I eventually came to really appreciate having that extra skill training that early on in the game. Pizza Escape has an achievement requiring you to parry 10 Fork Knights, which taught me as early as the second level that there was a parry move, well before this tutorial pizza lady tells you about it. Not all of the achievements are great though, some are just kind of annoying. Like in Blood Sauce Dungeon, there are two damageless tasks, one for avoiding lava and one for avoiding buzz saws. Or Crust Cove, where you have to avoid getting hit by an explosion for the entire level. The worst one had to be in Oregano Desert, requiring you to beat the entire level without touching a single cow. That was just a pain in the ass. Already Pressed in Fast Food Saloon gave me some trouble thanks to the bug that I mentioned earlier, but like I said, that's been patched. Most of the chef tasks are fun to go for though, like finding the hidden Mort Cube and Bacon Room, or other achievements that require some small clever setup like hitting three enemies with a brick ball in the Pig City, or having a burger enemy shoot the ball in the hole for you in Golf. While I have my complaints about some of the chef tasks, most of them are inoffensive at worst or actually pretty fun. With excellent controls, a solid set of general mechanics, and in my opinion, some pretty fun side quests, all Pizza Tower really needs to do to stick the landing is nail the level design, and thankfully, it delivers in 30 minutes or less. While the first level is pretty straightforward, it accustoms you to the game's combat by throwing some pretty tough enemies at you during the escape sequence, as well as Fork Knights which can't be grabbed from the front. The second level, Pizza Escape, introduces transformations with this knight that slides in a straight line to break through obstacles. There are a ton of these transformations, and most of them only get used for one level. 
One of my favorites is the ghost seen in Waste Yard, which lets you freely fly around and pass through these cheese graters that normal Pepino can't. When you pick up a ghost pepper, it increases your speed, and if you get enough of them, you can use that speed to break through these special ghost blocks. It feels pretty good to control and even has its own secret room. In fact, most of the transformations get at least one secret room dedicated to them, which is a great way to make a little extra use out of them. Boxed is another great transformation, turning Pepino into a pizza box that can flap to fly upwards and spin forward for an attack and a burst of speed. The level design makes great use of it, with vertical rooms that take advantage of its multiple jumps, shocking blocks to avoid that'll turn Pepino back to normal, and a secret room that feels so satisfying to blast through. They aren't all this complex, some of the transformations are pretty simple ones, like the weenie mount that's basically just a horse, this barrel that slides under small gaps, or the ball that automatically rolls forward and also slides under small gaps. When they're not using a new transformation as the central gimmick, levels will often have their own unique properties to make them stand out. Blood Sauce Dungeon is almost entirely vertical, which really puts your mastery of keeping speed around tight corners to the test. The Pig City has these taxis that take you to little challenge rooms. Deep Dish 9 sees you travel across several different planets using these olive bubbles to float upwards, and one of my favorites, Golf, which has you smacking a cheesy golf ball around with different holes, a par goal, and everything. It somehow manages to be a decently fleshed out and fun golf minigame while also being a fun, fast-paced platforming level in line with the rest of the game. It's one of the most brilliantly designed levels in the game. Gnome Forest introduces Gustavo and Brick, a playable man and giant rat duo with their own unique control scheme. It's rare that you see 2D platformer characters with really unique movesets these days, considering just how many 2D platformers there are out there. Even Pepino himself borrows quite a lot of moves from Wario Land 4. However, Gustavo and Brick manage to bring something new while still being satisfying and fun to play as. Most moves are the same as Pepino's, so it doesn't completely throw you for a loop when you just randomly gain control of a brand new character. You can still jump with A, do a dashing attack forwards with X, run with the right trigger, ground pound by pressing down in midair, but the details are all different. Instead of running straight up walls, Gustavo uses Brick to bounce up and off of walls, which can be chained infinitely to climb upwards. They also get a new attack by pressing up and X at the same time, where Gustavo kicks Brick forward in a ball to knock down any enemies in his path. Lastly, they have a downward slam that can break metal crates from above and also acts as a pseudo double jump. Most of this level is played as Gustavo and Brick, but you do eventually go back to that guy to finish the level. They even make a return in the Pig City to bust Pepino out of Pig Jail, and this action adds even more new elements to complement their unique gameplay, like these rat balloons or pig cops who steal Brick until you can reach them as Gustavo alone. It's kind of a shame you only see them in two levels, because with such a unique moveset, I feel like they could have done a lot more with them, but I'm also glad that they don't overstay their welcome. They're a great addition to spice up some otherwise pretty straightforward levels. From here on out, I'm gonna go into spoiler territory. Big secrets, late game levels, bosses, and the ending. If you don't want to get spoiled on any of that, skip ahead to the timestamp or to the next chapter in the video where I'll give my final thoughts. Three, two, one. One of the craziest surprises this game has is in the Floor 2 level, Fun Farm with special guest Mort the Chicken. Yes, the same Mort the Chicken from that crappy PS1 game with the hilarious cutscenes. Mort attaches to Pepino's head for one of my favorite transformations in the game, giving him a double jump and a forward pecking attack that can swing him off of these special Mort hooks. There's even a secret room with a hidden Mort cube. I love this so much, but man I wish they hadn't shown this off until the game's final release. I already knew about the Mort cameo going in, so it was more of an, oh yeah, I forgot about this moment. Had I not known, I would have lost my goddamn mind. Thankfully, not everyone has been spoiled on this surprise, and you can still get some great reactions. Try out the farm level. I'm a southern moor, that's where I belong. Yeah, special oh guest. My god, the chicken? Oh my god! Oh my god! What? Wait! What? Hold up! No! Wait! 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 Stop! Wait! You stop! Wait! Stop! Wait! You Mort, cannot stop. just name drop you, you, that! You, you, you cannot you, just you name can't. drop you, Mort the chicken! You can't just put Mort the chicken in your <laughs> 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 I do wish that Fun Farm and Gnome Forest were swapped, though. It would have put more space between the two levels where you play as Gustavo and Brick, and saved the Mort cameo for a little later into the game. Not a big deal, but I felt it was worth bringing up. The fifth and final floor of the game is home to some of the best levels in the entire game. Pizza Scare is the most traditional of the three, but it has this really cool gimmick where you're being chased by the King Ghost, which will haunt nearby objects unless it gets stuck in a TV. Then you might need to break it out to progress. This level also has some of the best uses of the ball transformation, including one secret that requires you to bait one of these bats downward to kick you into a ball to break this pin rat. Next is my favorite level in the entire game, Don't Make a Sound. In this level, you're sneaking through a pizzeria filled with mutated animatronic topping monsters. 
If you trigger the alarms, they'll wake up and start chasing you, and this tense music starts playing. If one of them catches you... The jump scare just makes you restart the room and turns you into this little toy pepino that spells out all your points for a few seconds. Then you're back to normal. I love how each of the secrets in this level has you running from a different animatronic for the entire secret, and they've actually got some decently tricky movement in them. One little detail that I really appreciate is that you can purposefully trigger the alarms early without waiting the full 5 seconds by taunting in front of them, which is useful for some of the required alarm sections when going for a high rank. In fact, it's absolutely required to get the P rank, since otherwise you wouldn't be able to get through the secrets without losing your combo, thanks to the mandatory 5 second wait at the start of each one. This level is also home to one of the most clever puzzles to hide a secret room in the entire game. I noticed these electric blocks covering up a pathway into the floor here, and knowing that the animatronics can destroy these blocks, you naturally have to get one to follow you back here. Problem is, the animatronic is to the right of this area, and the alarm is even further past it. The trick is to get in range of the alarm, and then use the 5 second cooldown to run back to the left before the animatronic wakes up so it can follow you back and break the blocks. Now, while the core concept of the alarms, animatronics, and jump scares are all really clever, what ties everything together is the escape sequence. You get a fucking shotgun and just blast away the animatronics like it's nothing. It's super cathartic and honestly really funny. Finally, there's war. In this level, the entire thing is an escape sequence. As soon as you grab the shotgun at the start, the timer starts ticking, and the only way to get more time is to make it to these computers before you run out. This is by far the hardest level in the game, spamming you with tons of enemies and explosives and missiles and whatnot, and it took me a good few tries before I managed to finish a run of it. Once I had the route down though, I kicked this level's ass, and it felt so rewarding. Another fantastic level, and a great finale to the game's collection of incredibly creative, well-designed levels. The levels are already fantastic, but what really elevates them are the escape sequences. I thought this was a pretty neat mechanic back in Wario Land 4, but here in Pizza Tower, it's been perfected. While many levels are a simple run back through the level, each one will have rooms unique to the escape sequences, so there's still some on-the-fly action there. A lot of times, certain collectibles will be exclusive to the escape sequence route, so you still have to explore while under the threat of a time limit. Fortunately, the time limit is pretty generous, and even when you do run out of time, you can still sometimes make it to the goal before Pizza Face catches you. The only levels where running out of time in the escape is an instant loss are War and the final level. In all the rest, running out of time spawns Pizza Face and he runs after you. He's really fast though, so unless the rest of the level to the goal is a straight shot, you're probably not going to escape in time, but it can happen. Since the lap 2 portals are locked until you've beaten the level at least once, your first run through the level will give you plenty of time to explore the escape route thoroughly and learn where everything is. Going for S or P ranks are where things get interesting, as you now have to contend with the escape's lap 2. This is required to earn S and P ranks, and doing two full laps under the time limit can be really tight. I rarely finish levels with time to spare after going through lap 2, and it was always a huge relief to get that S rank after so much pressure building up throughout the escape. It's insanely satisfying. Some lap 2s even have unique mechanics, like in Freezerator, you do the first lap of the escape as Fire Pepino, using his fiery spin move to break through ice blocks and instantly kill enemies on contact. The second lap then takes away your fire, but since you destroyed all the ice blocks in your way on the first lap, you can run through it all as normal Pepino just fine. There's even a chef task in this level that can only be done while on the second lap. Don't Make a Sound and War both give you a shotgun for the escape sequence, but in War, the second lap takes away the shotgun, so you're left fairly defenseless in one of the toughest levels in the game for the entire second lap. The lap 2 mechanic is absolutely brilliant, as it adds an extra level of tension and demands that you know the level inside and out before you're able to get the higher ranks. It's a great way to measure skill and add replayability. One really cool feature is that if you manage to beat the tutorial in under a minute and 45 seconds, something only a player who is experienced with the controls will do, it'll unlock the lap 2 portals for every level, meaning you can attempt SRP rank stages on your first run. A great feature for replaying the game and for 100% speedrunners. I can't stress enough just how good this game's level design is. Everything from the flow of the platforming to the unique transformations to the creative gimmicks to the intense escape sequences makes for a great pack of distinct, inspired, and most importantly, fun levels. This game is a masterclass in 2D platformer level design. Finally, we have the bosses. I honestly wasn't expecting them to be as good as they are, but they've actually got quite a lot of depth to them. Most of them don't make you wait around too long in between hits, but it does still follow the usual shtick of dodge attacks, counter attack, repeat until the boss is dead. With one exception. The first boss is Pepperman, who attacks you with some pretty straightforward dashes and stomps, but the second phase has a lot of stuff going on at once. That's kind of a consistent problem with the bosses. They can be very visually noisy. 
One thing that I think would help to avoid that is making it so that when you or the boss take damage, instead of having these hats fly off towards the center of the stage, have them fly off the opposite direction. I found them very distracting, especially earlier on in the game and in the fourth boss. When you have these things flying down the screen while you're trying to pay attention to Peppino, the boss, which attack they're doing, enemies walking on screen, hazards flying in from the top, etc., it gets overwhelming. Next up is the Vigilante, a gunslinging glob of cheese. In this fight, you attack him by firing a gun at him. You can either spam single bullets really fast, or charge up your gun to shoot a mega bullet for extra damage. I like this a lot, but I do have a complaint. Firing the gun is mapped to the X button, the same button you normally use to grab, and so you're not allowed to grab while holding the gun. They also use this for controlling the shotgun, but that's a two-handed weapon, so it makes more sense there. For a little pistol? I don't see why you can't let players still use the grab as a burst movement option and just map firing to the left trigger or something. So long as there aren't any enemies for Pino to grab onto in the fight, which there aren't, it wouldn't really be a problem. You can do every other movement with the pistol just fine, even others that require the X button like the uppercut, but not the dash? This isn't really a big deal for this fight since it's fairly easy, but the pistol returns later in a much harder fight and it was really annoying there. Third is The Noise, a riff on The Noid, which has gained a cult classic iconography lately due to its silly design and cartoonish nature. Given the pizza theme of the game, an old Domino's mascot is a pretty great choice for a parody. He falls even more into the trap of dodge attacks than counterattack, with longer attack animations and 16 hits worth of health. This is where things start to get a little stale, especially when going for damageless runs. This is how you P-rank the bosses, which is a chef task on each floor. This may not sound so bad, but when the later bosses take this long to kill, it can be a serious endurance test. Getting P-rank on the noise took me 45 minutes. At that point, it's just annoying. The fourth boss is one of the coolest in the game, Fake Pepino. Each one of his attacks are weird bastardizations of your own. He seems to be some kind of freakish mutation of a frog or something, based on certain animations and sound effects, and you really start questioning just how nefarious things are behind the scenes in this tower. The fight itself, though, is probably the worst one in the entire game. This takes the waiting around and dodging attacks to a totally different level. After each hit, you have to sit there and dodge these really long attack animations where a bunch of fake Pepinos use a new move to try and get you. One of them you can literally just stand there doing nothing and they won't be able to hit you. There is a really cool part at the end where he mutates into this freakish monster and you have to run away from him in this awkward underground corridor. The main bulk of the fight is pretty boring though. It's a really cool fight on paper, but in execution, it's an absolute slog to P-rank and took me another 45 minutes to grind out. But that's nothing compared to the final boss. Now, in a casual run, this is an excellent final boss fight. It's lengthy with four phases, it keeps mixing things up in each phase, it's fairly challenging without feeling unfair most of the time, has some incredible music, and comes with the twist that Pizza Face was just a machine controlled by this Pizza Head guy the whole time. The first part of the fight has you face off against the face itself, finally getting some well-deserved revenge after all the times he chased you down during the escape sequences and killed your S-rank runs. There's nothing more satisfying than pile driving an enemy into Pizza Face's stupid pizza face. It does get a bit crazy with the enemy spam towards the end of the phase, but I don't mind it too much since hitting him will destroy every enemy in his path towards the wall, clearing things up a bit for you. The second phase has you fighting Pizza Head himself, and this is where the pistol returns from the second boss fight. Here, however, you're dodging much crazier attacks. There are some great ones here though, like when he throws the TV with your face on it at you and it bounces around the screen, or when he changes into a baseball uniform and pitches Brick the Rat at you. Halfway through this phase, Pizza Face comes back to drop these little cogs onto the battlefield, and no joke, depending on your luck, sometimes it'll just be straight up impossible to avoid the cog and Pizza Head's attack at the same time. This is by far the hardest phase of the entire fight. It feels like it goes on forever, and sometimes you'll just get fucked over by bad luck. And without an available burst movement option, there's just nothing you can do about it. In the third phase, Pizza Head brings back every previous boss to attack you all at once, but Pepino is so filled with rage that he absolutely wrecks their shit in just four hits each. This part of the fight is actually really fun thanks to these satisfying attack animations. The final phase has you up against Pizza Head in a one-on-one -on -one battle where he uses a few cartoony attacks back to back. It's honestly the easiest part of the entire fight, but I admittedly did lose a P-rank run here once. Speaking of which, the P-rank on this fight is absolutely dreadful. While it is a really cool final boss casually, it's just way too long to do damage lists. It took me over three and a half hours. I wish I was exaggerating about that, but I checked the footage. 3 hours and 40 minutes, to be exact. I never want to do that again in my entire life. It was horrible. 
This is where you really start to feel the frustration of Phase 1's enemy spam and Phase 2's unfairness. I do really like the bosses in this game, but doing them damageless for 100% was not fun at all. At least I only had to do them this one time, I've got the achievements now, and I'll never have to do it again. When I went back through on my second playthrough, I had a lot more fun with them, aside from the still pretty boring fake Pepino fight. Anyway, once you take Pizza Head down to his last bit of health, Pepino starts wailing on him so hard that they ascend up into the sky, and then Pile drives him all the way back down into the tower. It's such an incredible moment and feels insanely satisfying, though I honestly wish this part had some QTEs or something instead of just being a cutscene. If I was the one spamming X to push them higher up into the air and then pressing down to deliver the final pile driver, it would have felt way cooler. Still, it's a really cool way to end the fight. Once the deed is done, you go back into the tower one last time to break the final John pillar and run all the way back to the entrance before the tower collapses for good. This wasn't exactly a secret, there were escape elements like the clocks and John blocks all over the tower hub for the entire game, but actually playing it feels so cool. There are enemies and gimmicks from every level packed into one fast-paced, tense escape, and it's a perfect way to end the game. Along the way, you'll pick up all the friends you made along your journey throughout the tower, all escaping alongside you. Once you're all out, everyone celebrates together in the newly reopened Pepino's Pizza, and you get all these funny images of the characters and wacky scenarios during the credits. I love it, it's so charming. After the credits, you get Pepino's Final Judgment, basically a full game ranking based on your percentage. There are a few of these different end screens, and it's a really cool way to wrap up your playthrough. My favorite is definitely the 101% ending, but I won't spoil that here. You'll have to do it for yourself. That wraps up Pizza Tower. This game absolutely blew me away with its hilariously charming art style, comedic tone, and expressiveness, the fantastic controls with some really great depth to them, and incredible level design with some of the best variety and ingenuity I've seen in a 2D platformer. This game deserves to go down as one of the best indie games of all time, up there with the likes of Cave Story, Undertale, Celeste, and maybe even Among Us. I have no doubt in my mind that I'll be replaying this game over and over for years to come. It's just such an incredibly fun game to play. I absolutely adore Pizza Tower and couldn't recommend it enough. If you like platformers, you should play it. If you like games with charming unique art styles, you should play it. If you like games that are more challenging, you should play it. If you play video games, you should play Pizza Tower. Simple as that. I might be a bit biased here, it's definitely one of those games that feels like it was made just for me, but still, I loved it and I'll gladly recommend it to anyone. I may have some issues with the game, but they're mostly small technical hiccups or minor design flaws. The vast majority of the game is an overwhelmingly positive experience in my opinion. Special thanks to Hot Cider for contributing to the review. If you enjoyed his section, there will be an extended version up on his channel sometime after this video gets uploaded, so go check that out when it's up. If you're still hungry for more Pizza Tower review content, he's also done his own review videos, so be sure to give that a watch too. All of those links will be in the description. That pretty much wraps it up. If you enjoyed the video, do please leave a like and a comment and all that, and subscribe if you haven't already. I do really appreciate all the support I've been getting lately. Special thanks to all the patrons here on the screen. If you'd like to support me monetarily, a link to my Patreon will be in the description. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.